Welcome back, my dear students, and welcome to a new lecture related to our course. In the previous lecture, we have demonstrated together what what's the main concepts of a DC DC converters, including what we call a back converter, where we back or we step down the voltage from a high level to a lower level, or what we can call a boost converter, where we boost the voltage from a low level to a high level, or a generic topology under the title back boost converters. These are, or these may consider the main three or the most famous three topologies for DC DC converters. As I mentioned in the previous lecture, the topologies we have we have studied together is just considered as a principal topology used in order to explore the main idea of the DC-DC converters. However, by visiting literature, you will find a lot of other topologies where a trade-off is conducted in terms of power efficiency, maximum ripples, response time, and a lot of other parameters related to the complexity of the system and so on. However, if you remember, my dear students, in early lecture in this module, we have considered that nowadays, and especially when we consider low power application, one of the main challenges nowadays is to scale up down your electronics from using a dis discrete bulky devices into what's called the CMOS or the integrated circuit technology. And whenever you have circuits with main uh, components represented in terms of capacitors and coils, this becomes very challenging in terms of converting into a CMOS or an IC chip. So in this lecture, my dear students, we are going to consider what we can call an inductorless DC-DC converter. The main concept actually of the inductorless DC-DC converters is related to what we previously introduced as a smart sensor or SOC or SOS, sorry, or sensor on a chip. A sensor on a chip or the SOC technology is related toward converting everything in your smart sensor to be chip based. And as I just highlighted, the main issue related to the DC to them, DC DC converters is that mostly DC DC converters uses bulk capacitors and bulky inductors that lead to what we call an off chip component, either to have an off chip capacitor or to have an off chip inductors. Accordingly, a lot of architectures and a lot of tricks has been implemented in literature toward re, re maintain or maintaining the functionality of the DC DC converters without the need of these bulky inductors and high values for capacitors. So what we are going to demonstrate today is just one of these attempts using a technology called switching capacitors. So how we are going to use switching capacitors to functionalize uh, DC DC converters. So in order to do so, let's start to describe this idea from the beginning. What is a switching capacitor? Okay, to do so, let's start with very basic integrator or we can call some sort of an active amplifier I think that all of you have somehow seen this schematic before, maybe in your foundational electronic classes or something like that, with a resistance, a capacitor, a, a, an operational amplifier, as you can see. So just a very quick briefing to what this schematic is doing. So this is an operational amplifier where we have a non -inverting, an inverting input and non-inverting input. Usually, when, when we do this analytical uh, description for this operational amplifier, it makes sense to assume an ideal operational amplifier. An ideal operational amplifier is associated with some basic concepts, such as 
that we are assuming that the current flowing inside the operational amplifier is equal to zero. We are assuming also that the, the voltage in the non-inverting input is equal to the voltage in the inverting input. That's because the input impedance assumed to be infinity. So we can assume here an open circuit between these two terminals. That's why we don't have any current incident. And we assume an open loop gain of infinity, and we also assume an output resistance of zero. This is some basic assumptions related to the operational amplifier. So using these basic assumptions related to operational amplifier, we can make some sort of an analytical analysis to this operational amplifier. So let's start first doing this, such an analytical description for this operational amplifier. Okay, as you can see, my dear students, we have here our operational amplifier. This is a negative, this is positive. The positive is connected to ground. And this negative here is connected to some sort of a resistance. So there, this is the input, as you can see. And here we have a capacitor. And this is R. So this is R. And this is okay, that's great. Then, as I just mentioned, we can assume that no current is going inside this operational amplifier, which basically means that the current flowing in the resistance will totally go to the capacitor, as you can see. And also, another important information that the voltage in the non inverting input and the voltage in the non inverting input are equal. So basically here you can say that this is ground, so we can call this what we can call a virtual ground. Based on that, you can make a nodal analysis at this virtual ground, considering that the current flow flowing in the resistance equal to the current flowing in the capacitor. The point current flowing in the resistance is basically the input minus zero, because this is a virtual ground overall, equals to the current flowing to the the capacitor, which is zero minus the output over C or over sorry over one over J omega C. So from this description, you can say that V input over R equals minus the output J omega C, or in another words you can say that V output over V inputs equals to minus one over J omega RC. So this is basically one form of having an input output relationship, considering that V output and the V input, you can, of course, this is a complex relation where you can find the magnitude, the magnitude basically will turn with one over omega RC. So this is a basic relation for an integrator, as I just described. So herein, we can have another, of course, here, the, the value omega RC is a very uh, fund, foundational or very important uh, parameter to be considered because simply when you have omega equals zero, that will turn to an infinity. So this is very hard. And when omega equals to uh, infinity, this turns to zero. So as a filter, this is considered as some sort of one high pass filter. Uh, that's why it's acts as an integrator mathematically, but this is not our topic now. But let's now see how we can manage this uh, 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 relation somehow. So we can manage this relation in a very easy manner. What if, Let me return back here to the slides. Okay. So what if my dear students, if what what if if, if we did this schematic? So yes. Yeah, okay. So now we replace this resistance with a capacitor. We call it C1. We call this C2. And we have this capacitor bounded between two MOSFETs, as you can see. Herein, these MOSFETs are working as 
as which is, you know, basically from electronics that most of it can work either as an amplifying the stage, which I think you already have studied a lot of application where we work or where we deal with most of it as an analog amplifier, or it can be also considered as a switch. So this switch is controlled somehow by a clock. So we call this a non-overlapping clock. It's an non-overlapping clock basically because when phi one is equal to high, phi two is, is 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 equal low, and vice versa. When phi one is equal to low, phi one phi two is equal to high. That's why we are non-overlapping. So, what's happening now during the this t clock or the the one period for our a clock? We have two durations. The first duration where phi one is high and phi two is low. Basically, what happened this uh, as following. What happened in this duration that this phi one will turn to be a short circuit, as you can see here, and this phi two is turned to be an open circuit, which basically means that you detach this part of the circuit with respect to this part. So you have now a circuit with two portions. This operational amplifier is totally detached, and you have a, your input connected to the capacitor. And basically, you can understand that in this case, the capacitor is going to be charged from the from the uh, input source. Alternatively, in the second portion of the clock, where you have phi one is low and phi two is high, so what happens is typically the reverse process. So now this is an open circuit and this is a short circuit. So basically, you detach the input from the circuit. So no longer is connected and you connect the capacitor with the inverting terminal of the amplifier, as you can see in this below figure. As you can see, my dear students, this is this will turn to a discharging process because basically the voltage here is a virtual ground, it's zero, and this capacitor is a charge. So basically, once you connect these points together, capacitor will start to discharge across the circuit. From your basic understanding, you can see that what you do is, is simply you use an intermediate capacitor for overcharging and discharging. So in the first process, you charge the capacitor with the input. Then in the second process, what you have been charged, you are going to discharge in the circuit. So it's some sort of reconnecting the input with an intermediate storage tank, which is the capacitor. But the question is, what is the basic difference between this circuit and this circuit? Are both of them are doing the same function? And what is the advantages of any one of these circuits with respect to the another? So let's try to answer this question. So here we are we have a new input to our circuit, which is the clock driving these two switches. So you have an input source and you have a uh, two clock here driving your input. So your input might be an DC signal or it might be an AC signal. In all cases, we will make an assumption so that we will assume that the frequency of your input is much, much, much smaller than the frequency of your clock, which means that during one clock, so for example, if this is your input, so I'm sorry, if this is your input, the clock is doing something like that. Okay, so in one clock, as the frequency of the, the input is much smaller than the frequency of the clock, that basically means that in one clock, the variation of the input will be very, very small. Or in other words, we can assume that in one clock, the variation, the input is nearly constant. This can, can be typically right whenever the frequency of the clock is much higher than the frequency of the input. Okay. So how this assumption was, was, was going to help us? 
as you know from your circuit classes that the current flowing in a capacitor can be given as C dV by dt. So the current is equal to the capacitance value with the rate of a change of the voltage with respect to time. Based on what we just mentioned, we can say that during this incremental variation, which is delta V, we consider that the input is nearly constant. So instead of having dV by dt, we can write that this is the input, where we assume that this V input is nearly constant during an interval called Pc. So now your relation is becomes I equals C over Tc times V. And as you can see, my dear students, this is typically a linear relation between current and voltage. And as already all of you know, whenever we have a linear relation between voltage and current, this represents some sort of an resistive relation. So here we have some sort of an equivalent resistance of a value called IC, sorry, TC over C, where TC represents the time period of a clock and C, of course, is the capacitance. And this is an equivalent value for a resistance. So as you can see from this, while replacing our resistance with this two, yes, here, yeah, okay. While replacing our resistance with these two MOSFETs, in between we have a capacitor. Simply speaking, this equivalent to our resistance. So this portion of a circuit is equivalent to a resistance with a value, equivalent value, of course, equals C over or TC over C. According to this, my dear students, and returning back, if we apply the same concept we have studied here in this circuit, if you remember, we mentioned that one over RC or the, the value RC is a fundamental value here. So in order to, for example, to consider the cutoff frequency or to, 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 to search for the cutoff frequencies of your filter, if we consider this as a basic filter, the value RC is a, is a critical value to be understood. Now, instead of having RC in this circuit, we have now R equivalent C. And of course, this is C2, which is this capacitor. So which which turns to be Tc C2 over C1. So instead of having this RC value, we turn to be Tc C2 over C1. Again, as far as these two circuits somehow doing are doing nearly the same process because simply we replace this resistance with these two MOSFETs and any capacitor in between. The question will be, what is the advantage of this new circuit? What is the advantage of using this switching capacitor concept with respect to using a basic resistance? Of course, it is much more easy to have one resistance instead of having these capacitors with this capacitor with a MOSFET and a driving clock and all this stuff. So what, why we are complicating the circuit? And the answer here is very easy. First of all, now your driving clock becomes a very critical parameter in the design. So you can simply tune your, your design by simply changing the driving clock. This is the first, first added value. A second added value, as all of you know, whenever you are using any electronic component, you have to consider what's called a tolerance. And that tolerance mainly is a, some sort of a variation with respect to a mean value. So for example, I can say that this is a resistance. Resistance is one kilo ohm plus minus 5%, which means that its value can vary plus minus 5% of the one kilo ohm. Now, whenever you are designing a certain filter or, or a converter or any electronic circuit, usually you are considering the mean value. But realistically, the, the, the real value may deviate. 
to the mean value with some sort of a variation, which is the tolerance. So, for example, if you are designing a filter with a certain critical cutoff frequency, due to the tolerance effect, this, this, this frequency may differ either to step up or step down based on the tolerance value. Now, you can totally ignore those effects, or let me say you can totally, or you can basically eliminate these effects or reduce this effect by reducing the, the value from using an absolute value of an RNC, as you can see in the left-hand side, to use a, a ratio value, C2 over C1. So this is another important parameter to be considered here that considering uh, ratios somehow reduce the effect of tolerance rather than considering absolute values. A third important selling point related to this switching capacitor effect is the values itself. For example, if you need to design a filter and you need a capacitor uh, to, to satisfy the equation, you need a capacitor to be, for example, a uh, 50 microfarad capacitor. A 50 microfarad capacitor is a very big capacitor in terms of a CMOS technology. So most likely you have to use an off-chip capacitor in order to satisfy this 50 kilo, this 50 microwatt farad. However, in the other technology, in the switching capacitor, you don't need to restrict yourself about, about absolute values. Yeah, because basically you are searching for ratio. You will, you will tune your TC and then you will use the C2 over T1 as a multiplying factor. So you can, for example, use a capacitance in the peak of a and maintain a certain ratio between C2 and C1. And herein, you can use a, what we can call an integrated on a chip capacitance instead of using an off-chip of, off capacitance. And if you remember, my dear students, this is actually the main challenge toward having an IC based or a CMOS based or an inductor-less DC DC converter is to get rid of inductors as well as to get rid of these off chip capacitors with relatively high values. So you can now understand why we are going to use a technology like a switching capacitor technology in a DC DC converters instead of using inductors and capacitors. And I think now it's somehow clear for me. So the next question will be how we are going to use such a, a technology in order to investigate, I'm sorry. Yeah, in order to investigate the DC-DC conver converters. Okay. Let's see the schematic. Okay. In this schematic, my dear students, we are performing, or we have four transistors. Of course, all these four transistors are acting as a switch. And their clock description can be given this schematic. So as you can see, my dear students, when the first clock or the first signal, we call it here R1, so R1 went high, so R2 is low, R3 is low, and R4 is high. So that means that switch number one and switch number four will work together to be a short circuit, while switch number two and three are an open circuit. And vice versa, when switch number one and switch number, number four are off, are an open circuit, switch number two and number three will be a closed circuit. So if we go on together to write the path or to plot the bus, we can say that in the first case, so R1 is on, then we have the capacitor, then R4, R4 is on, and then we have the remaining of our circuit. So this will be the path when R1 and R4 are uh, on. Alternatively, uh, the, path, the other path will be uh, when uh, the other two are off will be so we will start from here. This uh, R2 R, R, R is on. So this is something like that. And then this is again short circuit. And then this is a capacitor. And of course, here you get rid of the 
so, so your source is no longer connected. So these are the two passes considerable for our case when we have uh, uh, R1 and R4 on and when we have R3 and R2 on. So let's see the circuits. Let's see what or how the circuits will, will look like when your uh, your uh, the transistors are on and off. So we will have this, the first circuit, as you can see, my dear students. So as you can see here, now this is the first circuit. So R1 is short circuit, R4 is short circuit. So basically what will happen here is that your voltage source is going to charge two capacitors. This, what we call here C fly. Usually this is a very common name for the capacitors used in the switching capacitors. We call it C fly because it's a flying capacitor between these transistors or between these uh, switches. So this is a first um, uh, charging and this is another capacitor charging. As you can see here, my dear students, Basically, you can consider that your load is, or your output voltage is considered in some sort of a potential difference between this impedance and this impedance. So the, the, in a very basic manner, you can calculate this voltage as the voltage drop here and there. We, we can do it together. Let's, let's, let's do it together. Okay, so... As you can see here, my dear students, we have the input, this is the input voltage, and this is C fly, and this is C. Okay, and then we have our load here. This is C. So, Basically, it's a, some sort of a potential divider. If this is the input and this is the output, you can say that the output equal, as you can see, the voltage drop here, which is one over J omega C over the voltage drop uh, as a submission, one over J omega C plus one over, this is plus one J omega C fly. So by, uh, getting, rid, by getting rid of all these C fly is, uh, sorry, all G, G omegas and multiply by uh, uh, C uh, in the denominator and denominator, you can basically get one over one plus uh, C over C fly, or you can make it in another way, C fly over C plus C fly, as you can see. So let me write it in a, in a better way. So as you can see, As you can see, my dear students, I'm sorry. Uh, as you can see, my dear students, the, in, the input, uh, the output, sorry, equal C fly over C fly plus C times the input. So using this equation, it is basically uh, uh, considerable that now the output is below C input. So there is a ratio C fly over C plus plus, uh, C fly over C fly plus C is typically smaller than one. So that means that the output is lower than the input. So as you can see here, we are doing some sort of bucking of the voltage because the output voltage is below the, uh, the input voltage. So let's do it or let's see it again here. So here, this is the, the charging phase or the first phase of the clock where we have uh, an input connected to the output as you can see. Okay, in the other ways, basically what will happen is you are going to detach the input. Now your charge will, will, will going to, uh, your, your capacitor is going to discharge and load, maintaining the same voltage. So by the end of the day, this is the voltage variation on the C fly and this is the V output. As we just proved that the output is typically below the input whenever uh, uh, C fly over C fly plus C is smaller than one. So this means that you are bucking down your voltage. This is the first formula or the first uh, way of making a buck converter, as you can see, without the need of a, an inductor, just by using a capacitor and this flying switches. So this is the first 
concept of having a very, let me say, a very basic uh, uh, back conversion. As I just mentioned, maybe in the beginning of this lecture, of course, these are a very basic topologies. If you go to the literature, you will find more and more sophisticated and more advanced topologies. We are just using these topologies because it's, as, uh, to some extent, easy to, 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 to describe uh, these phenomena using such a basic topology. So this is the first circuit. What about the second circuit? So this is a second circuit. We still have the four switches, but with different arrangements somehow. And again, if we monitor the clock, so first we have clock, uh, the, the, the first and the fourth um, MOSFET are working together. And then the second and the third. So let's see together how this will uh, happen. So again, using our friend now, the first and the fourth are short circuited which means that basically you have something like that, as you can see. So you have, uh, and now as far as this is an open circuit, so your load now is detached. You don't, your load is not connected to the circuit and you have only a capacitor with a source. So now the source is charging the capacitor. Then in the, in, in the second round, what will happen is that you have uh, the first and the second are connected. So you will have something like, that I think, yeah. So you still have the load, you still have the flying capacitor, and uh, so you have you still have the input, you have the flying capacitor, and also you have the load. So these are the two basic uh, circuits. So let's see how this will act toward a, a DC DC converter. So, so in the first circuit, whenever the first and the fourth are short circuited or are on. It is basically clear that what you are just doing is you are charging your capacitor. And based on this very simple circuit, your, your capacitor will be charged with a voltage equal to V input. So now the voltage over this CFY equals to V input because typically this voltage will remain until we have here a short circuit. So the voltage here is equal to the voltage there. Now, in the second discharging phase, what you what you manage is now you have a, a V input and you have another V input. This is very basic because now the voltage here is V input and the voltage on the capacitor is still the input because it is just charged. That's, me that's meaning that your output voltage become double the input voltage. You have an input voltage here and you have an input voltage here. So this is... Basically, now they are connected in series, so the voltage here is double. That's why you will find that here the output voltage is double the input voltage, and there you are doing what we call as a boost converter. So you are boosting your voltage aboard by using this topology. So this is basically how we are going to manage the, uh, the process of charging and discharging either in a back converter or in a boost converter. Of course, maybe some of you ask what is the role of this capacitor? I think this is a very important capacitor because if we don't have this capacitor, my dear students, what will typically happen is that whenever you make this point like that, that load will automatically discharge the capacitor and herein your voltage will be equal to zero. Let's imagine that now you don't have this capacitor. So basically your output is equal to zero. But what will maintain the output here is basically this capacitor. This capacitor will going to maintain the output so that even in the discharging phase, as you can see here, of course you still have some ripples, but you still have uh, some sort of maintaining this double output. And by considering this, my dear students, you can easily understand that maybe one of the main disadvantages of the switching capacitors, or let me say generally, the uh, that inductorless technologies is somehow that you can have, in some cases, you can have some sort of ripples, as it, I think it's already clear here that we still have some ripples in the output and also maybe even in the uh, back converters, we are, we are having some uh, ripples, but still we are doing the process of bucking or boosting the voltage without the aid of an, of an inductor. Uh, 
And again, as I just mentioned in the beginning of the of, of the lecture, that now you turn that your capacitance process is in a term of a ratio process, not an absolute process. So you can even scale down the values of your capacitance so that you can adapt some sort of CMOS uh, values like a capacitance in a peak of rather or something like that. This is basically the concept or the very brief concept of having a inductorless DC DC controllers. That's all for today's lecture. Thank you very much. In the next lecture, we are going to consider the interfacing circuits for sensors. Thank you very much and wishing you a best of luck. See you next lecture, inshallah.